Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan. It's not often on this program that we discuss issues of health, but earlier this week, a national blueprint to address the growing problem of non-communicable diseases in India was released in Delhi. Uh, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, are uh, in many ways the more significant or the most important health problem that India is confronting, accounts for something like 60% of deaths and uh, an area which until now has not received the kind of public attention and official attention that it deserves. Joining me to discuss the blueprint and the whole issue of non-communicable diseases is Dr. Kenneth Thorpe, Chairman of the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease in the United States. You have been very active in the last decade, certainly the last seven, eight years, in pushing this idea that India needs to get serious about uh, non-communicable diseases. Now, in a country where the battle against infectious diseases is not over by a long shot, malaria, uh, encephalitis, uh, every manner of infectious disease, waterborne, uh, you know, the fight against that remains underfunded, inadequate. Uh, is it really time for us to make a shift in emphasis away from battling uh, communicable diseases towards NCDs? Well, I think you certainly need to focus on both. Um, certainly infectious diseases are probably a little bit underfunded, but if you look at the uh, key role that NCDs play in, uh, in the Indian economy, the Indian healthcare system, it really is dramatically underfunded. Uh, it does account for about 60% of mortality uh, in this country. It has an enormous impact on uh, healthcare spending, and it has a big impact on productivity of uh, Indian workers. So if India really wants to meet its potential in terms of economic growth, addressing the uh, non-communicable disease issue is going to be a central part of not only a health reform package, but an economic package. And so, so what are the big killers that we're talking about here? Heart disease for one. Right. The, the biggest ones are really cancer, heart disease, and you have a, a growing epidemic of diabetes. And COPD. I mean, the, Pulmonary uh, disease, right, yeah. hypertension. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that uh, when people have, they have multiple conditions. They don't just have diabetes. They have diabetes and pulmonary disease and depression and high blood pressure. So it comes in packets. We really want to make sure that uh, attention is focused on this because uh, these diseases, unlike infectious diseases, can sneak up on you. Uh, some of the symptoms are hard to detect. Uh, people don't oftentimes get screened earlier enough to uh, get those uh, diseases detected so we can treat them earlier. And unfortunately, take the case of diabetes, uh, unmanaged diabetes and undetected diabetes uh, oftentimes leads to blindness, amputations, uh, and so on. Now, these are things that we can prevent if we do earlier detection and, and effectively manage the condition. Now, you've been involved in the uh, discussion over a, a long period uh, in, with this uh, so-called national blueprint. Uh, you've argued passionately that India needs to have a national policy in place. Uh, and that piecemeal, a piecemeal approach to NCDs uh, will not uh, provide an answer. Uh, I know that the blueprint is the product of collective effort by many people in this country, and you've had your inputs, but why don't you share with us what the key elements of this blueprint uh, consist of? So the blueprint really was uh, broken into three major areas. And, and these three areas are all focusing on action. What can we do to actually implement change uh, to address the NCD problem? Uh, the three areas were, number one, better data, data and surveillance. Uh, if we can't measure the problem, if we can't track it, uh, it's, it's a difficult to really target resources appropriately. So I think working with the states need to de develop a better surveillance and tracking system. Second is infrastructure. Uh, there's certainly an undercapacity of physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, other types of uh, ancillary health care providers to provide good primary care uh, for patients. Also, just the basic infrastructure for clinics. We found some very good models of uh, uh, NCD clinics, health and wellness clinics that provide very good primary care. Uh, we need to build those out, uh, scale and replicate those good models that we've seen uh, throughout the country. And the final one was on healthcare financing. India currently only spends something on the order of 4% of its GDP in total on healthcare, 1% on the public sector, 3% of patients paying under out of pocket. Really, if we're going to make the, an appropriate investment in infrastructure, building out NCD clinics, uh, we're going to need an additional investment from both the public and private sector. So, so l l let's, let's follow the logic of these three different subjects that you've outlined. Uh, when it comes to data and information, uh, 
Uh, is it the case that the National Family Health Survey is the primary source? Are they, what are the sources of information or data that we well, are dealing most, with? Most of them are survey, but really if we're going to do this, we need to have en encounter data uh, on patients, uh, need to have a, a, a coding system. That's so so central, I mean, centrally collating this information? Not, not effectively, no. I mean, there are huge gaps uh, in, in what we know about uh, even how many di diabetics are out there. I mean, probably the best guess is 65 million, but that's, that's a real guess. How, how, how does data collection work uh, on, on the NCB front in the United States? Just so that we get a sense of, uh, not that the U.S. is the exemplar of public provision of health, but in terms of data, certainly you are way ahead of us and many other countries. So uh, is, is there a legal obligation for hospitals to track and collate and, and send this data to some central collection point? Well, there's a, a legal obligation uh, to, when, when hospitals bill for services, so for our, our public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, we have a uniform billing system that codes the patient's diagnosis. So those data are collected by the government for reimbursement. So we have a very good picture of what the uh, prevalence of chronic diseases among seniors, low-income populations. Our private health insurance companies use similar co coding algorithms. So our billing system is pretty consistent, uh, comprehensive, uh, and the incentive is if they don't collect the data, then they don't get paid. Right. So there's a big incentive to, to make sure that it's appropriately coded and collected. Right. Yeah, here I would imagine that's a major obstacle because data collection, even for uh, all kinds of, you know, well, infectious diseases or a range of other issues is pretty poor and the central statistical apparatus hasn't functioned as optimally as it ought to. Well, I think that's right. And, you know, unlike the United States where we have a, you know, everybody pretty much other than 10% has health insurance and we have a coding system in the public and private sector uh, that's, that's uniform, here health insurance is very, very limited, uh, private health insurance. So you, we don't have the uh, breadth of collection of data that we have in other countries. Let's talk infrastructure, which is the second point you mentioned, second pillar of the blueprint, if you will. At, at one level, India appears to be this country which supplies vast number of numbers of nurses and doctors for people all, all over the world. But uh, if you look at the absolute numbers or the numbers relative to the size of the population, uh, we're really talking about a drop in the ocean here. Uh, so is, is, so could one, is one making a case for ramping up the qu sheer quantity of medical education as a first step? Is that, is that an essential pillar for this? Oh, there's, there's no question. If you look at the uh, Indian healthcare system and the capacity, whether it's uh, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, hospital beds, they're way below what the uh, World Health Organization for similar countries recommends in terms of capacity. So I think if we're going to really provide more comprehensive prevention and primary care, we need additional training of those personnel. Uh, we need the, the, the NCD clinics. Uh, we need to have this curriculum built into what medical schools do uh, to make sure that uh, prevention and primary care are appropriately taught as well. It's been uh, a, a complaint of many people in the health sector, health professionals, um, that part of the shift towards a more open market economy in India from 1990 onwards has led to greater emphasis being placed on the private provisioning of health. Uh, this is reflected in budgetary allocations, which uh, in some cases have fallen, but at any rate are way below what they need to be. And uh, the general neglect of public health facilities. I mean, in, in, a, in a city like Delhi, uh, we get to read horror stories of uh, a patient who is admitted to a government hospital and then they don't get the treatment they need and then they finally die, uh, people being turned away. You can well imagine the picture in rural parts of, of India. This debate of public versus private, uh, do you think there needs to be a rethink and that the government needs to take public provisioning of public health facilities more seriously? Well, it's, it, the thing is, is if India is going to really solve this problem, they're going to need additional investments from both, both the public sector and the private sector. You know, the public sector can take care of the millions of people who live in poverty. Uh, by expanding uh, our, our SBY insurance, increasing uh, how much they pay uh, per patient, uh, things that are uh, being discussed. 
Uh, but if they're going to do that and build out to some of the public health clinics, I think appropriately, uh, we're calling for a, an increased public investment to go from about 1% of GDP today to about 3% of GDP by 2020. So there's going to have to be more resources devoted from the public sector, and there's going to have to be more resources uh, devoted from the private sector, yes. investing in, in facilities and looking at additional options for how uh, people above poverty, poverty uh, pay for their health care services. There's been some controversy here, I suppose lack of clarity because of uh, a shift the government made in, in the dispersal of money and accounting where they said, okay, we're going to transfer money to the, uh, to the state governments under the federal sort of division of, of finances uh, so that they would shoulder a greater part of the burden. So it's, it's clear that central allocation has come down, but it's far from clear that the money saved is actually going to go towards healthcare at the provincial level, and this is a problem. Well, I th think it is a problem. You know, one of the things that we're doing with the partnership to fight chronic disease is that we're a convener. Uh, we're pulling together uh, thought leaders from the private sector, from the states, and from the uh, government of India, uh, the Minister of Health level, uh, to basically come up with an implementation plan that really addresses the issue. And we're all, all going to have to work together to solve this problem. Uh, that the government, central government can't do it alone, uh, the states can't do it alone, and certainly the private sector can't either. So this really has to be a broad collaborative effort to, to, uh, to solve the problem. We provided some direction, some things to, uh, to look at in terms of implementation, but the financing discussion of who pays what for whom is a major issue. I can see where uh, how the private sector uh, could put itself in a position where it, where it deals with chronic ailments of the middle class and the well-to-do, right? Because if you work in a company uh, and you're fairly high up the food chain, chances are that you will be entitled to an annual checkup where many of these things may be caught early, certainly COPD or heart ailments. Uh, and of course, the public sector would take care of, you know, uh, emergencies that poor people have to confront. The problem is uh, chronic ailments among the poor, which is, I presume, uh, a large killer. Uh, and those often go undetected, those often go untreated, uh, particularly when, as you said, these chronic ailments come bundled together. Yeah. So somebody who's diabetic may also have uh, a heart condition or may suffer from uh, COPD. Well, part of, part of what we're recommending, too, is uh, an education campaign to really target at-risk populations to make sure that they go and get screened. Uh, the screening rates are low. The availability of, of, of screening uh, is not what it should be. So, uh, you know, the first step in this is really an educational mission to make sure that people who are at risk for different types of chronic diseases go and get screened for them. How important uh, a constituent uh, of uh, tackling chronic diseases would uh, awareness campaigns, say, against smoking be? I mean, in the United States or the Western world, uh, I think we've seen uh, a sharp fall over a long period in certain kinds of ailments thanks to uh, anti-smoking propaganda. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean in the United States we've taken smoking back in the 1960s it was about over 50 percent for adults down to about 20 percent. Today still too high. Um, smoking is obviously a major risk factor for a whole host of these chronic conditions. A variety of cancers, pulmonary disease, asthma uh, and so on. I mean, the, the good news of the NCD discussion, though, is that about 80% of the new cases of NCDs are potentially preventable. They are linked largely to things like smoking, diet, exercise, nutrition, uh, things that uh, we have a chance of changing if we work with uh, a variety of actors to get people to change their behavior. Uh, last year, there was some, I would say, anger in public health among public health professionals, when a parliamentary panel, which was reviewing a government decision to increase the size of pictorial warnings, anti-smoking pictorial warnings on cigarette packets, said we can't take a decision on this because, as one of the MPs said, uh, all the data on the bad effects of smoking on health uh, are uh, from the West and we don't have Indian studies, we don't have Indian data. How tenable an argument is this? Well, you know, people are people. And, you know, I think we have uh, uh, 50 years of uh, compelling data uh, uh, that shows that uh, smoking causes cancer. Uh, so I, I don't think that that, in, in most 
places is, is really a, a debate anymore. So I, I've been impressed, though. I've been watching a lot of Indian TV, and I've been impressed with the, the ads that come on uh, about the, the dangers associated with smoking with different, different TV shows. That's part of, it, I think, a, a growing uh, campaign on education that we need to have. But some of these other silent killers that are harder for people to really recognize the symptoms, high blood pressure, diabetes, for example, uh, we need to have a similar campaign to really target people that have bad diets, aren't ha having uh, appropriate levels of physical activity, are overweight and obese, uh, and really get them into uh, to, to screening programs. But one last question on smoking before we move to the, some of the other uh, issues. Uh, your advice as a public health professional would be that pictorial warnings on the dangers of smoking do work, they do help to cut down smoking? Oh, I think so, yeah. I, I think that certainly it raises awareness uh, to people that may not, uh, particularly young adults, uh, uh, teenagers that are uh, starting to smoke. You know, those are populations that uh, hopefully we can have an, uh, an impact on. You know, in most countries that, that we've studied around the world, that type of educational campaign, along with, uh, in the United States, we have very high excise taxes on cigarettes. Uh, we've banned, basically, advertising of uh, the cigarettes uh, uh, in, in the United States. So it's really a combination of different strategies that are going to prove to be effective. What, one of the problems that I, I foresee your uh, campaign to raise awareness on NCDs is going to encounter is the fact that uh, you have no control over wider environmental problems. I mean, there was, there was a scandal caused, well, the, the quality of air in India is a scandal. And, and when uh, the New York Times correspondent wrote a piece about how he would rather leave uh, the country uh, than subject his child to breathing the air of Delhi. Uh, there, was, there was all kinds of discussion and backlash. But at the end of the day, the fact is that the quality of air is pretty ghastly and is responsible for a large number of children, for example, de developing in the capital, developing asthmatic conditions. Are you concerned that health professionals are only one set of voices and that the factors that are generating pollution in many ways are too powerful. Well, there's a whole host of different interventions that are going to be needed to address this issue of NCDs. You know, we really break it down into three things we need to do. Better job of preventing them in the first place, detecting them er earlier, and more effective management and engagement of patients once they have them. And on the prevention side, there are a whole host of different strategies that you could use. Uh, walking paths, better availability of fresh foods and, uh, and vegetables, lifestyle education, uh, nutrition education, certainly issues around uh, water, air, all, all of those things come to play. So really, I think for any country to be effective, it will involve multiple uh, ministers uh, uh, of health and uh, external affairs, internal affairs, to really deal with this because there's all kinds of factors that really are leading to the growth of uh, NCDs in countries like India. There's been some discussion about uh, sound pollution also leading to chronic ailments uh, of the nervous system, of heart. Is that also something which uh, the links are fairly clear, clear about? Well, I think the links are a little bit less clear, but certainly the issues of, of how it affects uh, somebody's mental health, anxiety issues, stress, those are real important markers for heart disease. So to the extent that we can do a better job of uh, reducing those markers, that's going to be proven to be effective as well. So people should turn down the loudspeakers when, they, uh, when they're causing public uh, uh, inconvenience. Uh, the question of, of, of paying for all of this is a crucial one for a, for a country like India, where the government would say we have limited resources, our ability to, to tax and spend uh, may not be adequate. Uh, and there is a push by the private sector and by insurance companies to say that, ins that insurance can fill the void. If we look at Western models of, of health, uh, we see even in North America a contrast between the Canadian system, which is essentially public funded public health care system, and the United States where it's insurance driven. Uh, given that India doesn't have, well, it doesn't have a very well-functioning public system and the private insurance system is in its infancy, what would your advice be? Uh, which path is better for a country like India to choose? 
Well, there's a, a variety of models, I think, that we've been looking at. It's uh, the partnership uh, to provide suggestions on financing options. Um, so, for example, if the government expands uh, public health insurance for uh, low-income populations, increase what they pay uh, uh, per person, uh, and then allow uh, uh, change the way that private health insurance uh, is structured for people above poverty, workers and so on. Uh, today, th that insurance is largely limited to just inpatient hospital care. And the challenge is, if you're going to prevent and manage chronic disease, most of that is on the outpatient side, the primary care setting. Uh, so we've been looking at a discussion about uh, expanding private, ins private insurance or the ability even to buy into the public system for higher income populations on an income-related basis. If you have more money, you pay more. If you have less money, you, you pay less. Uh, so that's certainly one option. Uh, another option that we've looked at as a, as a transitory approach would be to make uh, these primary care clinics uh, available uh, and then have uh, a monthly subscription fee uh, that's based on income. So if you're poor, you don't pay, contribute toward it. If you're higher income, you would pay a, a, a small monthly fee, but you then have access to a defined set of primary care services. So I think there are models like that 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 can work. Indonesia just passed uh, a couple of years ago a, a national health care reform proposal that was insurance-based, a very similar notion that uh, the government would assume responsibility for uh, the poor, uh, that people who were workers and higher income individuals would buy insurance. In, the, in this case, they were paying a, a payroll tax. They were paying a, a premium of sort to buy into the system. Right. I mean, the problem here is many insurance, health insurance policies or schemes don't seem to cover chronic, chronic ailments. Uh, how, do, how do you get around that in the U.S.? Well, in the United States, uh, our health care reform that we passed in 2010 requires 10 essential health benefits. This is the so-called Obamacare. Obamacare. Yeah. So every health plan in, in the United States has to cover 10 essential benefits, uh, including primary care, outpatient care, pr prescription drugs, uh, and so on. So it covers a whole range of inpatient care all the way through outpatient care. So if, 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 in, if insurance uh, were to make greater inroads in the overall public scenario or health scenario, uh, it would have to be underpinned by some kind of uh, legislative framework? That, is that what you're arguing essentially? That, I would think so, that yeah. That would prioritize and stipulate what, what, what has to be given. Right. I think you'd have to lay out, like, it's a matter of you know, how detailed you want to get into it, but if you're going to really provide comprehensive coverage, you want to have inpatient, outpatient hospital care, uh, access to physician services, uh, home health, prescription drugs, nursing facility. So, uh, you know, really a, a set of essential benefits that would span the range of needs, both acute care and, and chronic care as well. And just to shift focus away from India to, to your home country, it would be a shame not to take advantage of your presence here. Uh, in the five or six years, five years that we've, we've had Obamacare function, would you say that... Uh, President Obama, when he demits office, will have uh, fulfilled the promise that he made of ensuring every American, regardless of her or his income, would have access to essential health care? Or is, is there still a lot of unfinished business? Well, there's still a lot of unfinished business, but there's no question that uh, the percent of the population that doesn't have health insurance has dropped perhaps in half. So he's made a big dent in reducing the number of people who don't have health insurance. But even bigger than that, we've completely reformed the private health insurance market. Uh, in many states in, in, in the U.S., if you were an individual working for a small business and you had an NCD or pre-existing condition, uh, health plans could just deny coverage. Uh, that's gone. So uh, health insurance plans in the United States have to allow anybody to buy their product regardless of whether they're sick or healthy. And that's been a major change. And this has happened without the apocalyptic increases in tax that the uh, Republicans warned would happen? That's right. It, you know, the, the taxes that were, uh, that were raised in the original bill uh, have been more than sufficient to pay for it. Uh, a lot of the uh, financing came from reducing the growth in, in Medicare spending. Uh, so you know, it has actually contributed to reducing the, the budget deficit rather than increasing it. On that note, Dr. Thorpe, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us on Indian Standard. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, that wraps up this episode. Do join us again next week with another guest. Yeah.